Amen. Well, we're going to uh, continue in our series tonight that I've titled Studies in Pneumatology. And last week we covered the fact that the Gentiles were given the infilling or the baptism in the Holy Spirit um, after quite a long time of, of course, being considered dogs and uh, Gentiles or non-Jews and outside of the covenants and, and the promises. But God demonstrated at Cornelius' house that he is no respecter of persons and that he will fill any person with his Holy Spirit that's willing to repent of their sins, turn to Christ in absolute faith, and uh, surrender their life to him. But this week I want to talk about a different kind of facet of the Holy Spirit. Now when we talk about pneumatology, of course, that's just a fancy, maybe technical, theological term for uh, studying the Holy Spirit. And uh, pneuma or pneuma is the uh, same word we get our word pneumatic from. Uh, pneumatic tools runs off of compressed air. And um, this particular subject I want to talk about is honoring the Holy Spirit. And if you want to turn over, if you just want to read uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 24 to 32. Now, I want to sort of preface what I'm about to read uh, with just a couple of thoughts. Number one, it's interesting how early on we find this particular passage of Scripture dealing with the Holy Spirit and such a strong warning about how the Holy Spirit is, is not to be treated. I remember as a child reading this verse or these verses and always being gripped by it and how I took it so absolutely seriously as a warning from, from the Lord that the Holy Spirit is, is not to be treated in a wrong way. And from the early days of my childhood, even when we didn't go to church, uh, I really, and for lack of a better way of saying it, had sense enough to know to reverence God and reverence the Holy Spirit. But... Um, I'm terribly afraid that we're losing, uh, fastly losing that in modern times. and People don't realize how serious these matters are. But I just want to read uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 24 to 32. Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say unto you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Those are really strong words. That is a strong warning that we are not to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And in having titled this particular lesson today, um, Honoring the Holy Spirit, I want to say a few things and just kind of move along, and I'll just try to quickly go through all of this. 
But the scripture is replete with people who quenched, grieved, resisted, vexed, and even blasphemed the Holy Spirit. We see that in Isaiah 63, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, Ephesians 4, 30. And that's basically five things. And I want to just take them each and just just briefly touch upon some things that maybe you'll find of, 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 of usefulness. First of all, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, do not quench the Spirit. Now, uh, when I think about quenching the spirit, obviously we're talking about quenching a fire. Uh, when you quench a fire, you're just basically putting it out. And the Holy Spirit is sometimes uh, identified as fire. And I said here, the pers- a person quenches the Holy Spirit when they seek seek to put out the fire of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in their personal life. Or among the churches of God. God starts moving. God starts dealing. And they quench what God is doing. Again the Holy Spirit is sometimes pictured as fire in scripture. And fire is an energy source and a light source. It creates heat and can cause motion or movement. Fire must always be treated with great care. We don't really have an appreciation for fire like they did, you know, 100 years ago, 150, 200 years ago, going all the way back to to ancient times. Because without fire, you couldn't cook, you couldn't boil water, you couldn't have heat if you needed heat, you couldn't have light at night. So many things required fire. And the same thing is true in a spiritual sense. When we look at the way the wilderness tabernacle was all set up, God had a specific fire that was to be used in all of the service of God, whether it was on the menorah, whether it was on the altar of burnt offering, the altar of incense, all of that was to use God's unique and holy fire. When Nadab and Abihu decided that they were going to innovate and offer strange fire or common fire before the Lord, they were burned up. And that showed us forever God's estimate of using some other kind of, if you will, energy source or fire than the Holy Spirit or God's fire in the service of God. Um, I think that is a very important thing. We don't have time to stop there, but that's, that's important to think about. In the service of God, my last point there, his unique fire was to be used only. One couldn't strike a match, uh, and then the fire of God just come. So in other words, you cannot, and I, I don't want to miss this point here, you cannot just decide when the fire of God comes. The Holy Spirit initiates His own work. So when God starts stirring among people, when He starts stirring in our personal life, when He starts stirring in a church, it's at that time that we have to respond to Him. We can't just decide, well, I think, you know, sometimes we try to hold a revival, but that's not really how revival works. God stirs in a person by his Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And as we respond to him, he will begin to do the work that he wants to do. If we quench that, then we'll miss God. Because we can't just decide when we want God to move. We can't just decide when we want to, for example, have a revival. We need revival in America. We need revival in churches. We need revival in all kinds of ways in our personal lives. And we can pray for revival. We can seek God for revival. But until he moves by his Holy Spirit, until he sends, as it were, his fire, uh, we can't just drum something up. God's got to send something down. You know, we can't work it up. It has to come down. And, And again, using this picture of fire, Paul said, do not quench the Spirit. When God starts to kindle a fire, if you will, of his dealings and moving, don't quench that. Don't quench it in the church. Don't quench it in your personal life. Don't do it because you don't have the power to restart that up. You can't rub a couple of sticks together and God move. We have this mentality today, if we'll just sing, the fire will come. 
Uh, or if we'll just do this, the fire will come. But that's not really true. God doesn't dance to man's drum like that. God moves sovereignly according to his purposes. And when he wants to move, it's that time that we have to move with him. Right. We can't tell him when to move. We can't force him to move. We can pray. But when, when his fire comes, it's at that time we are to operate. It is his fire. It is under his control. We can quench it, but we can't light it. See that? We can quench it, but we can't restart it. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not much of a survivalist. If I was ever out in the woods, especially if it was wet like today, I'd be dead in the water to get a fire started. And spiritually, we can't get a fire started. God's got to send a fire down. It's the way it always was in the Old Testament. It's it's a picture that we have. The fire comes from heaven. It doesn't go up from the earth. If it does, it's strange fire. If God stirs his people by his spirit, and men and women quench the spirit, they have no promise that he will move among them again. Think about times when God has tried to move in revival in churches, in communities. I think about missed opportunities. Um, it's so easy to to quench or to mess up something God's trying to do. That's why it's so important for people to take Paul's words seriously. Do not quench the spirit. You know, a lot of times God will try to move in a person's life or he'll try to move in a church and tell you there's all kinds of crazy reasons it happens, but people will just try to snuff it out. You know, they'll just try to snuff out what God's doing or... You know, we don't want God moving right now. You know, we'd rather be doing something else or, you know, we got something else planned. God, you're interrupting our plan. So they'll they'll quench what God's trying to do. And they have no no promise that he's going to move among them again like that. Because we can't tell God when to move. He moves when he sovereignly is ready. And it's very important to know that. This is why quenching the Holy Spirit can be a dangerous thing. We, we miss, risk missing, rather, We risk missing what God is trying to do. We can miss God. We can miss God if we quench the Holy Spirit. And that's a very serious thing. Secondly, grieving the Holy Spirit. And I'll try to hurry. Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed until the day day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 Of course, the Holy Spirit is not a force. Although the Holy Spirit has, you know, can use force. Uh, The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. Holy Spirit is not a goosebump. It's not a sense of a presence. The Holy Spirit is a person. Holy Spirit is not a tongue. It's not a manifestation of the gift. You know, those things are all gifts of the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is a person. And we have to think in these terms because. If we don't think of the Holy Spirit as a person, we won't treat him like a person. A person can be grieved, and the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit is a person who possesses what we would call personhood. And just as we feel pained or grieved when things are going wrong, so too the Holy Spirit can be grieved by people's actions. Um, we can grieve the Holy Spirit in our life. We can grieve the Holy Spirit in the church. Uh, anytime we're doing things that are contrary to what God wants to do, uh, you can pretty well know that we're grieving the Holy Spirit at some level. The Holy Spirit is grieved when believers act carnally. When we, when we act carnally, when we're, we're not loving or we're doing things that are sinful, things that the Holy Spirit uh, would never at all be involved in, uh, we grieve the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they were doing things that greatly grieved the Holy Spirit. I mean, here they were operating in the gifts, but where they were saying things like, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. They were going and suing their neighbors, you know, their own fellow brother Christians and things like that. All kinds of different things they were doing to cause problems. They had uh, fornication in the church that uh, Paul said wasn't even like what you even find in the world. So, I mean, all these things were going on. I mean, they thought they were spiritual because the gifts were in operation, but the truth was that church was utterly carnal. And the Holy Spirit was obviously grieved. 
The Holy Spirit is grieved when believers entertain anger or hostility and bitterness. You can grieve the Holy Spirit by, we've talked about this before in Isaiah 66, we need to make ourselves, our, our, ourselves, our body, our inward selves, if you will. That's really kind of a psychological term, but we need to make ourselves a place of God's rest. And God can't be at rest if we're all hostile and and all these different types of things. So we need to be careful uh, what we entertain in our thoughts, what we entertain in our heart, uh, whether it be anger or any other thing that would be contrary to sound doctrine because we risk grieving the Holy Spirit um, in us. The Holy Spirit is grieved when individuals respond, refuse rather to respond to his dealings. He's grieved. And uh, we, we'll talk a little more about that in just a minute. The Holy Spirit is grieved when churches refuse to hear and hearken to what he's saying to them. Seven times in the book of Revelation, the scripture said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When people are not listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying, they're not hearkening to what God is saying, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's just it's just one more kind of step in the process. Then thirdly, resisting the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is resisted when a person refuses to cooperate with him as he's dealing with them. In Genesis 6, he said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for he's also flesh. The Holy Spirit is striving and trying to get man to do what they're supposed to do and be in the image that God created them and according to his will, but people resist. That's what... Uh, Acts chapter 7, Steve, Stephen said, You're stiff-necked, you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. In other words, it was a pattern over time. I mean, you go back generations, they would be resisting the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I've written about this subject along this line, but in modern times, and I, I hate to have to say this, but People want a salvation where they can keep resisting the Holy Spirit. They want a salvation where they can keep resisting the Holy Spirit. And there's really no such thing. Uh, Part of getting right with God is to stop resisting the Holy Spirit. Uh, You know, a lot of people want to receive the Holy Spirit, but they're resisting His authority. They're resisting His dealings, but they want to receive. You know, and that's a dangerous thing. Because Paul said in one place, he said, if you receive a spirit that you've not received as it were from us. I mean, people, there's no telling what people are receiving when they're trying to receive something. But inwardly, they're rebelling against God. But they're wanting power. They're wanting all, to be able to operate in the gifts of the spirit. But God hasn't established his authority in their life. So they open themselves up, in my view, to demonic spirits. All kinds of things. It's dangerous stuff. To resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is resisted when he brings conviction of sin and the person refuses to acknowledge what the Holy Spirit is convicting them of. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit is resisted when he brings conviction of sin and the person refuses to acknowledge what he is convicting them of. When God puts his hand on something in our life, We need to acknowledge it. Lord, that is sin. And I renounce that. You know, I'm not going to call it a mistake. I'm not going to, you know, pretend like it's not happening. When God puts his hand on something, we need to acknowledge it or confess it. 1 John 1 and 9 says if we'll confess or acknowledge our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to acknowledge, and that's the hardest thing to get people to do. People just don't want to acknowledge that they've done wrong, that they are wrong, or any of these uh, types of things. The Holy Spirit is resisted when God's voice in the mouth of his ministers is declaring the righteousness of God and the people refuse to listen. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, Jesus said, he will convict or convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When a person gets up and preaches righteousness and the people listening are resisting, not wanting to hear it, they're resisting the Holy Spirit. There was a point in which God told Samuel, 
when the people wanted a king, Samuel was very grieved. And um, God basically told Samuel, he said, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And people think that when they're hearing a preacher preach that they're rejecting that man's word. But if he's preaching, especially under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what God is saying, in other words, the voice of God is in the mouth of that person, preaching righteousness, trying to see them straighten up and turn and fly right, if you will, they're not resisting the man. They're resisting the Holy Spirit. And it, it gets to the point to where in resisting the Holy Spirit, it, it's not just a passive thing. Because if you look at the Greek term, it actually means to fall upon somebody. To fall on someone. You remember how when you know David's mighty men would fall upon somebody or the young men fell upon him. You read this in the Old Testament. Well, it, it's, it's not a passive thing. It's, it's, a, it's an aggressive attack that begins to start to happen. And that's exactly what happened to Stephen. He said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. A word that's a militant word. Next thing you know, they drug him out of the city, stoned him to death. Snuff the voice out, see? The Holy Spirit was in him, speaking to them. And to shut the Holy Spirit down, they killed the man. Pattern that went all the way back in the Old Testament. They killed many of the Old Testament prophets. Because they were full of the Holy Spirit, speaking on behalf of God. People didn't want to hear it. The Holy Spirit is resisted when a person obstinately refuses to obey what they clearly know is God dealing. This is more than a passive resistance. The religious leaders attacked those people in whom the Holy Spirit inspired to speak on behalf of God. Stephen is one of many in a long line of men who were killed because they spoke prophetically what God was saying. The Bible said in the last days they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want their ears tickled. They won't want to hurt. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and they'll turn them to fables. It's happening. It's happening every day in modern times. I'd like to park there, but we just have to move on. We're almost through here. <coughs> Finally, uh, well, actually we have two more. Vexing the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 63, verse 10. But they rebelled and vexed. His Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. Isaiah 63, verse 10. That word there, vexed, is the same word that's used in Genesis 6 in the Hebrew to describe how God, as it were, felt about how the people had become uh, so evil that the earth was filled with violence and all other kinds of stuff. And it grieved the Lord in his heart that he had made man. And that same word is is used here in in the Hebrew. I'm sure Drew would be able to point that out much easier than I could. But it's interesting to note that in both cases, this is not a kind of passive grieving of the Holy Spirit that we read about in Ephesians chapter 4. This is a a whole different level because in uh, in Genesis 6, God destroyed the world. And in Isaiah 63, God turned... Listen to what this scripture says. And he turned to be their enemy. And he fought against them. That's how bad they had grieved or vexed the Holy Spirit. That God turned to be their enemy. So, again, these are, these are very, very, very strong warnings, uh, I think. The Holy Spirit is vexed when the people who were called to be God's unique possession turn out to be as bad or worse than your average sinner. When they started doing things in Israel that, you know, the people who did before them, then God was just vexed, you know, and grieved. And he turned, uh, Isaiah 63 tells us. The word vexed is akin to the Greek word for grieved in Ephesians 4. Uh, And whereas the Holy Spirit can be grieved in the life of a believer, he becomes vexed when all attempts to rectify the behavior have failed. God tries to get people to straighten up. They won't respond. So he's vexed. And the next thing you know, there begins to be a turning. And that's a very, very dangerous thing, especially in a person's personal life. The Holy Spirit can be grieved in such a way that he leaves the person to themselves. He will leave a person to themselves. That's the worst That's the worst kind of judgment when God just says, okay. He backs off, stops dealing with you. 
worst kind of judgment of all. I mean, what could be worse? I mean, when God quits dealing with you, I remember my uncle Jay saying one time. Of course, he was uh, he was divorced when he was young, younger. And he looked at me one time. He'd been drinking, and I remember I was a young man. Never forget it. Might have been eight years old, nine. He looked at me. He said, "Robert," he said, "When you stop talking, it's over. When you stop talking, it's over." And I was just young. I was like, what, what, you know, what do you mean, Uncle Jabby?" I was a young kid. But years later, as I become an adult, I reflected on those words because I never forgot them. When the communication ends, the relationship's over. That's true. Personal relationships. That's exactly right. And that's what he was saying. That's when his marriage ended was when the conversation stopped. And that's what ends up happening with people when they resist the Holy Spirit, quench the Holy Spirit, resist and quench, and they keep on fighting the Holy Spirit. They get so hardened, and then finally God just kind of steps back. And leads them to themselves. And the book of Romans said, Wherefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It's a dangerous thing to resist the Holy Spirit because He will not always strive. One of the first things He taught us in Genesis 6, God will not always strive because He's also mortal. I mean, these are early foundational things in the Bible. But at any rate, in Genesis 6, God was grieved that he had made man the same word as used in Isaiah 6, 3, 10. It's translated as vexed. In Genesis 6, he destroyed the world and the people to save Noah and his family. In Isaiah 6, 3, 10, he turned and fought against his own unique people and became their enemy, if you will. And finally, in this section, King Saul vexed the Holy Spirit and God sent a demonic spirit to trouble him. That's an example of how... You know, it's interesting. When you look at Saul, he started off well. You know, it's like God gave him his Holy Spirit. But over time, even though God had blessed him in this way, never took away his own individual will. And slowly over time, he must have just grieved and grieved and grieved the Holy Spirit until ultimately he sinned the way he did. And Samuel just basically told him, you know, it's, it's, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Next thing you know, Saul's going to the witch at Endor to try to get a word from God. I mean, an evil spirit was sent to vex the man. David would play music to get that evil spirit to depart him. You see how he went from having God's favor and the spirit of God active in his life to next thing you know, he's got a demonic spirit he's dealing with. All because of his rebellion and his refusal to do what God told him to do. I mean, we're not talking about somebody who's just casually transgressing some commandments as bad as that is. This man was rebelling against direct orders from God. He had direct orders. He thought he could do his own thing, and he paid a terrible price. Finally, blaspheming in the Holy Spirit, and this is the end of what I want to just say tonight. Matthew says, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. I think that's supposed to be Matthew 12 there. Either in this age or in the age to come. I don't know about you guys, but that is very sobering to me. I remember again as a child, just people would give a message in tongues and I would just freeze. I wouldn't move. Somebody would talk about the Holy Spirit or being in a service and there was just a reverential. I wasn't terrified like I was in a haunted house. A lot of people just like to mock and talk about the fear of God. They're not even serious. They like to mock about these things. Oh, the... No, no, no. There was a reverential fear that would come that you knew God was present and you just didn't do all these silly little things. And I, I remember that as a kid, but as, as people become more and more familiar, at least in their mind, with the presence of God, they get more careless. They get more reckless. They get more boastful. They begin to do things that, that, that ought to strike fear in people. It ought to strike fear in a sinner, but they don't think anything of it. You know, uh, people mocking, people speaking in tongues and, and pretending like they're speaking in tongues and mocking and carrying on and acting like they're being touched of the Holy Spirit and making a joke of it. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but that scares me. That scares me when people make fun and make light of the moving of the Holy Spirit. You think sometimes people... Or doing those things 
don't necessarily realize what they're doing. I, I would say that if it's a sinner. But when you have church people doing it, I don't really, I don't really know. You know, the only thing I could say is it, it's just a dangerous commentary on where they are spiritually. Yeah. To me, it's just a dangerous commentary on where they're at spiritually. Because I, I couldn't, I couldn't even conceive of just right now making a joke of the Holy Spirit, making a joke about how, and doing something silly to kind of mock somebody maybe. Uh, being touched of the Holy Spirit, I, w- I would seriously, I would rather probably be put to death than to do something like that. That's how strongly I feel about it. But that's because I take seriously Matthew chapter twelve. Think about it like this: You remember when uh, Simon uh, the sorcerer and Peter were kind of conversing, and here's Simon Peter, he's laying hands on people. Simon. The sorcerer sees that's like, ooh, I'd like to have this power. He had been baptized. He had already kind of made a profession of faith. But here he is. Peter says later, your heart is not right towards God. Right. It's what he told him. Your heart is not straight. That's your Greek word. Towards God. What did he say? I'd like to buy this power for with money so I could lay hands on people. And they could receive the Holy Spirit. Peter's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And and what he says to him strikes fear in me. He says, go and pray to the Lord if perchance the very thought of your heart will be forgiven. It's almost like he didn't close the door to the possibility of forgiveness, but it was on its way to the latch. And he said, you better get it together right now because you have just about crossed the line. See, But people don't think that way now. I mean, they do the most flippant things about the Holy Spirit, you know, and and, and the way that they minister and the way that they make merchandise of the gospel and all these types of things. I mean, it's just Simon the Sorcerer all over again. But people don't think anything of it. I think we need a very healthy dose of the fear of God to return to us in these last days because people are are getting... I mean, we we live in a society that likes to laugh at everything, Everything's got to be funny. Everything's got to feel like a sitcom. If you're too serious, there's something wrong with you. And but but that's the society we live in. But when you take that approach to towards the Holy Spirit, that's dangerous. I mean, just ask ask Belshazzar how serious things can get. He looked up and the wall, hand appeared on the wall, and many many tekuu or however it's supposed to be pronounced. And it is just bad. But the Holy Spirit is blasphemed. When his workings, first of all, are knowingly attributed to Satan as or, or to an unclean spirit. They told Jesus, you have an unclean spirit, or that's Beelzebub. Well, no, that was the Holy Spirit at work. And they knew really what they were doing. So uh, Jesus warned them. He said, all manner of blasphemy will be forgiven, but not the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. People try to dance around that verse, but I'll tell you what, when your soul's on the line, you better take the most conservative interpretation to that. You don't want to be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is blasphemed when He is abusively spoken against. The Holy Spirit is blasphemed when He is lied on. Uh, That's one of the ways the word blasphemy is used. The Holy Spirit is blasphemed when false claims are knowingly made related to him. To say something is of the Holy Spirit that is not the Holy Spirit is dangerous at best and blasphemy at worst. I think it's dangerous to say, oh, that's the Holy Spirit, or that's the Holy Spirit, or that's the Holy Spirit. Hold on a minute. We need to test these things. We need to make sure that's the Holy Spirit before we go putting any kind of rubber stamp on something. Because the moment you attribute something to the Holy Spirit, you've made a statement about the Holy Spirit that's going to have to pass muster with Matthew chapter 12. People say things like, oh, I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit here. I hope it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. I hope it's not just an emotionalism that's created from the music. People are just too quick. And if you go back in history, anybody who's ever really read a lot of books books about uh, the Holy Spirit, books about the movings of God, going back, I'm talking about in in church history, 100 years and before, you didn't really have this reckless kind of talk that goes on today. 
didn't exist. This is a modern phenomenon. I mean, the church is almost 2,000 years old, and we've got about a 50 or 100 year phenomena that's growing. And we've gone from just calling anything a move of God, anything the Holy Spirit, to now people just saying and doing uh, things, you know, mocking and just carrying on. I, I don't know. I don't believe it's. I don't believe it's being an old stick in the mud to say that that's wrong. I don't believe it's being old school to say that's wrong. I say if you care about your soul, don't do it. Because, you know, I'm not going to hell for what somebody else does, right? I mean, I used to tell my boys, and I know it sounds rough, I'm not telling you this for me. I'm telling you this for you. Because I already know this. You know, but sometimes people say, are you trying to tell me what to do? You, 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 you transgress the commandment to your own peril. Because we've been warned. And it's a very serious warning. I remember back years and years ago, people hardly ever even used the term the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. unless they were teaching on the Holy Spirit, something about God and the Holy Spirit, unless they were teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or something about the Holy Spirit. They rarely ever used the term mm-hmm. Holy Spirit. Right. I mean, they were so reverent, you know, they had such reverence for the Holy Spirit that they didn't use that term lightly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we went through a period, we went through a period when I first got saved, and um, and I'm not going to name any names because they're pretty well notorious at this point, but there were preachers that would get on television calling themselves the Holy Ghost bartender. You know, uh, seriously, like, you know, almost like they're just passing out the Holy Spirit, like they're passing out drinks and people get drunk in, on the Spirit. I mean, these are crazy things. But it's, 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 a, it's a demonstration of irreverence for God. And we just can't allow it to take place in our life. We can't do it because, because the Holy Spirit is to be reverence. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling or a force. The Holy Spirit doesn't come when we start singing here at Delaware Fellowship or if we're outside at Maywood or even if we're in any church. When they strike up the band, the Holy Spirit doesn't come. The Holy Spirit is a person. And when we, and, and when we treat Him in a way that, that he, he is not to be treated, we are on dangerous ground. Finally, the Holy Spirit was nearly blasphemed again in Acts 8 when Simon thought he could purchase the gift of laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit with money. Peter told him to pray if perhaps the thought of his heart would be forgiven. This is how serious it is to play games with the Holy Spirit. You don't play games with the Holy Spirit. If I were teaching little children, you know, a lot of times today it's all about teach kids how much God loves them. Well, that's great. But you better teach them to fear the Lord. Because if you don't teach a child to reverence God from the time they're a child, there's no telling how they act when they get old. We don't have to be afraid of God. He's not the big bad wolf. You know, God is not, uh, he's not the big bad wolf or he's not a monster and he's not just going to attack you. We don't have to be fearful of God in that kind of way. But we have to be reverent of God. And uh, show me a place where there's a reverence for God, and I'll show you a place where God's voice is found. I'll show you a place where people are seeing God move. Show me a place where there's irreverence, and I'll show you sin of every kind. I think that's true. But anyways, did you guys have any other thoughts?